I'd like to speak this morning on the theme, Faith for the Journey. We will be looking at various passages of Scripture, and I trust that in our time we will find not only the be impressed about the importance of faith, but also the need for us to have what I call enduring faith as we face the journey that is before us. But even more important than faith, if we can even consider that there is something more important than faith, because the Bible is clear when it says that without faith it is impossible to please God, there is the need for vision. And I want to spend a little bit of time this morning talking about vision. Let me give you my definition of the word vision. Vision is an inspired look at reality. I'd like to say it together one more time, then I I want you to say it back to me. Vision is an inspired look at reality. Now you say it to me. Now consider for a few minutes the implications of that statement. Vision... To have vision is to be able to look at what is and have divine inspiration and insight while you look at it. It does not change what is. It just gives you an ability to see beyond what is to what it can be when it is infused with the divine nature of God. That's what vision is. About seven years ago, I drove past this barn out here. And God dropped something in my bucket called vision. And all of us, I trust, in the Lord, have had a time when God, you were walking with God, and we're going to be talking about Noah, and God comes along and drops something in your bucket. It's called vision. The scripture that I would like for us to look at this morning is Proverbs 29 and verse 18. Familiar passage of scripture. Where there is no vision, the people are unrestrained. But happy is he who keeps the law. Another, this is the New American, but another version, I think it's the King James, says where there is no vision, the people are perish. I want to impress upon your heart, first of all, if you do not have vision, the Bible says you will perish. Where there is no vision, the people cast off restraint. They're unrestrained. Where there is no vision, because vision enables you to be restrained from doing evil. Also from Habakkuk chapter 2 and verses 2 and 3, it's in your notes, it says, Record the vision and inscribe it on tablets that the one who reads it may run. For the vision is yet for the appointed time. Note, the appointed time. It hastens towards the goal and it will not fail. Though it tarries, wait for it, for it will certainly come. It will not delay. Genesis chapter 8 says that Noah walked with God. I can I picture Noah, he's 500 years old, It's hard for me to picture that. But he's 500 years old. And the Bible says in Genesis chapter 8 that God was very displeased with the men and women in the earth. But then it describes Noah as this man who walked with God. Noah's having a good time walking with God. He's not doing anything evil. He's walking with God, fellowshipping with God. He is different than the rest of society that has... The rest of society, the Bible says that they have done everything imaginable with regard to evil. 
And Noah's just walking with God, fellowshipping with him. And God comes along and drops something into Noah's bucket. Noah didn't ask for it. God comes along and he gives him a vision and a burden. And he says, Noah, he said, look, I'm really displeased with mankind. And I'm going to destroy man from the face of the earth. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to build me an ark. If I was Noah, I'd have said, God, you know, I enjoy walking with you. I'm having a good time fellowshipping with you. My family's doing well. I'm 500 years old. Couldn't I just kind of cruise into retirement and then you take me out of here? Now, whose vision and burden was it before it was Noah's? It was God's. Noah and his sons are given this vision of an ark. God gives them the dimensions. According to Scripture, it says in Genesis chapter 9 that Noah was 600 years old when he and his family entered the ark. He labored on this ark for a hundred years. God said to him, I'm going to destroy the earth with a flood. And it's going to rain for 40 days and 40 nights. Up to this point, it had never rained. It had never rained. Noah had never seen rain. Faith, you have the definition in your notes. Faith is being sure enough of what God said to obey. God says, Noah, I'm going to destroy the earth and I want you to build an ark. And if you build the ark, I'll bring the animals. And he labored for a hundred years, he and his sons, and they built an ark for one purpose, so that God would have a remnant of people who were not destroyed in the flood. That was Noah's purpose. I wonder how many of us, when we consider having a vision, a purpose, a burden of the Lord, would be able to do what Noah did. For a hundred years he was laughed at and ridiculed. I am sure that when he told the people, he explained to the people what it was that he was doing, and they said, what is rain? What are you talking about, Noah? Noah says, well, I don't even know what it is. All I know is God has told me to do this because he wants wants a place to bring all the animals and and those who will listen to his voice and come into the ark because God's going to destroy the earth. For a hundred years he kept communicating that message to those who mocked him. And then we have Abraham. God brings a promise to Abraham that he is going to have a son. You know the story. Sarah decides that because her she is barren, unable to bear children, that Abraham should take her maidservant, and he does, and Ishmael is born. When the prophets came, or the angels, I'm sorry, when the angels came to Abraham and Sarah and again declared to them that they were going to have a child in their old age, Sarah laughed. When she considered the fact that both her and Abraham were past the childbearing years and were old, and the angel of the Lord turned to her and said, Is anything too difficult for the Lord. The angel of the Lord said to her, at the appointed time, you will bear a son. I would like to just for a few minutes talk about the the progression of vision. 
In your notes, you see kind of like a timeline there that I put in your notes. And the first is the birth of a vision. And I'd like to put it up here on the overhead as well for those of you that perhaps may not have notes. You and I are walking with God. Now remember, God's desire, God's activity, His focal point of activity is the earth, not heaven. God's desire is that no man would perish. God so loved the world. So God is looking for men and women that He can deposit something of what is in His heart. And that these men and women will live the rest of their life to see that that which God has put in their heart will come to pass in the earth. It's called vision. It's to be, it is the ability to look at what is and to see what it can become when the divine nature of God comes upon it. And that is not only people. It has to start there with people, but it is also material things as, as we call them. That, that those things can be used for God's purpose. So it goes something like this. This is the place of the birth of a vision. And I call it the place of romance. One of the other reasons I wanted to share this this morning is here's the danger that is before us as those who have walked with the Lord for a time. How many of you remember when you, when you came to the Lord, He apprehended you, and you, you had zeal for God? I remember that so well in my own life. My dad remembers it very well. After I had backslidden and, and, and came back to the Lord, I was a young man with zeal without knowledge. I was like a bull in a china shop. Anything that got in my way, I ran it over. All in the name of Jesus, of course, and for His sake. And I, I don't think that the Lord was dismayed at that. Obviously, I needed some maturity and growth. When we come to the Lord, most of us come and have a vision, a desire, a dream, as it were, of what we are going to do for God. And after we walk with God for a season, something happens to the vision, to the dream, to the desire that we had for God. And many of us are relegated to a religious experience where very little life is left in our walk with God. The place of romance, the birth of the vision, Whenever that was for you, and I believe that most of us who are serious about our walk with God know when that was. When God gave you a vision, if it was for your own life or for your family or for your business, for your community, remember that the purpose of vision, God gives us vision in order that His purpose might be accomplished in the earth, not ours. Vision is never for your own agenda. It is never for your own agenda. It is always that God's purpose would be fulfilled in the earth. That's why He gives us vision. But you remember that day when God gave you vision. I remember the day that He gave me vision. It was the place of romance. Romance is related to your own exaggerated opinion of your ability to fulfill the vision. That's what romance is. You're in love with the vision. You love it. Aren't I going to be a great man of God? Aren't I going to do great things for God and His kingdom? Noah, when he heard what God called him to do, he said, boy, what a day that's going to be when God's going to come and destroy the earth, but I'm going to be in the ark. My day's coming. But between that day 
That day when God was going to destroy the earth, there was a hundred years of work in order to fulfill the vision. But you remember that day when God gave you vision. And that was the place of romance. And you were in love with the vision. You had an exaggerated expectation of your own ability to fulfill the vision. Now listen, if you do not have vision in God, something's wrong. I want to impress it upon you. If you do not have vision, there's something wrong. We're going to talk about what happens to the vision. After God gives us vision, He takes us to a place in our walk with Him that I call, and, and Watchman Nee has done a, a very good, good thing on this, called the death of a vision. Every one of us comes to the place in God where God takes what He has put in our heart and for whatever reason, and I understand, I think I understand the reason why there is death to the vision. We have to die to that which God has put in our hearts. Now listen to me carefully. This is the most critical place in your journey in God that any of you can find yourself in. Listen, this is the place of cynicism. The death of the vision is the place of cynicism it is when we push the little escape button and say, God has failed me. God has let me down. God has not fulfilled what He said He would do in me. No, thank you, Lord Jesus. I'm going to go do something else. Cynicism is the, a view of others that believes that all human conduct is directed by selfish intentions. A person who is cynical. How many of you have watched Primetime Live the last two Thursday nights when they did things on TV Evangelist? Any of you seen it? You sat there, have you watched that and said, dear God, they're all a bunch of liars, deceitful. I sat the first time and watched it. In fact, I didn't watch it. A friend of mine taped it and brought it over and let me see it. And I said, oh God, I want to watch this, but I don't want to become a cynic. If you become cynical and lose your faith in God, you become susceptible to be scandalized by God and you are in dangerous territory. Listen, when God scandalizes you, nobody can help. I don't mind it if my brother scandalized me, but at least God's on my side. But when you feel like God has scandalized you and failed you, where are you going to turn? Anywhere but towards Him. The place of the death of the vision and the reason why God has to take us to that place the reason why God took Abraham through the process, now listen to me, the place of the death of the vision is where Ishmael is born. It's where we say, God, now listen, I've got vision, you gave me something, and I'm going to make it happen even if I have to do it in the flesh. There's a lot of Ishmaels in the spirit running around in the church today because the people of God refuse to wait on God. God takes us through this process so that He would impress it upon our heart that the vision will never come to fruition apart from the divine infusion of the power of God. God gave Abraham the vision. He is not going to Fulfill the vision through the flesh. And God has to take us through the process where we die to the vision so that He can resurrect it on the other side and we, we look at it and we say, listen, I understand that that which I saw in the Spirit I had vision for was given to me by God. It will never come to pass until God does it through me. 
I am just so amazed at God. I'm, I'm, my wife and I are in a situation right now with another couple. And maybe this is why this is so on my heart, where this very thing is happening. The death of a vision. And when it happened, this person pressed the escape button and said, I'm finished with this. God has not fulfilled my expectation and dreams. I don't need God anymore. In fact, I don't need my husband. I don't need the church. I don't need my children. I'll see you later. Scandalized by the Lord because God did not fulfill in this person's time what they thought God was going to do. The scripture says in Habakkuk 2, 2 and 3, it says the vision is for an appointed time. You're to write it down. Inscribe it on tablets. You are to wait for it, for it will surely come. It will not delay. Once once you have gone through the death of the vision, and it's hard. It's hard to go through the process where God takes that which He has given to you and you yourself have to die to it. Listen, I want to explain something about the death of the vision. God doesn't kill the vision. He deals with your expectation of yourself and your own ability to fulfill it. That's what He deals with. When Abraham went into Hagar and had Ishmael The promise and the vision that God gave to Abraham was still there waiting to be fulfilled. God did not withdraw that from Abraham. He does not kill the vision. He just kills your expectation of your own ability to fulfill it. And when you come out on the other side, then you face the need for faith. And faith is not in your own ability. It is not in others' ability. It is faith in God. I would like to have you turn to Hebrews chapter 4. The place of faith is the place of dependence. The place of faith is the place of risk, of prayer, of faith, and of rest. It is the place of risk, of prayer, of faith, and of rest. A resting in God, a dependence upon God to fulfill it. As you've turned to Hebrews chapter 4, I'd like to just read. One of my favorite writers from from the past is Oswald Chambers. And I'd like to read just a few quotes that he has with regard to this whole matter of prayer. See, I am convinced of this, that no one... Or let me say it this way. If you have not become a praying person in God, you do not understand the process by which God is going to fulfill that which He has spoken about you in your own life. If you do not come to the place of prayer where you begin to pray, because it is when you touch the divine power of God through prayer, that you will come to realize that the fulfillment of the vision will only be accomplished through the power of the Holy Spirit. Listen to what Oswald Chambers says. When a man is at his wit's end, which is what I believe to be the death of the vision, it is not a cowardly thing to pray. It is the only way he can get in touch with reality. I love that statement because you want to get in touch with reality. God is reality. I love it when Job was going through his testing and, you know, Job had his three friends and uh, the three friends tried to tell him what was wrong and why he was going through all of this and then along comes Elihu. He's a young man. And Elihu says to Job, he says, Job, why don't you say to God, Teach thou me to see what I cannot see. 
That's always been my prayer. I read that and I said, oh God, teach me to see what I cannot see. When a man is at its wit's end, it is not a cowardly thing to pray. It's the only thing or the only way that he can get in touch with reality. Oh, that I knew where I could get in touch with the reality that explains things. There is only one way, and that is the way of prayer. Another quote, prayer is not to be used as the petty, petted privilege of a spoiled child seeking for ideal conditions in which to indulge his spiritual propensities. The purpose of prayer is the maintenance of fitness in an ideal relationship with God amid conditions which ought not to be merely ideal, but really actual. Actualities are not here to be idolized, but to be realized. While by prayer we lay hold on God and He unites us into His consciousness. And another one. When we lean to our own understanding, please listen to this. We bank on service and do away with prayer. When we lean on our own understanding, we put our confidence in service. And consequently, by succeeding in the external, we fail in the eternal. Because in the eternal, we succeed only by prevailing prayer. That which God has placed within us can only be accomplished through His divine working through us. And that will only happen as we demonstrate our faith in God through our prayer to God. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, let us fear lest while a promise remains of entering his rest, any one of you should seem to have come short of it. For indeed, we have had good news preached to us just as they also. But the word they heard did not profit them. Now listen, because. And let me add, I... I I don't want to, I'm not trying to add to the word, but understand something. I believe it would be accurate to say this. The reason why the word did not profit them is because they had become cynical and the cynicism had robbed them of faith in God and they say, I don't believe it. I've seen too much, I've lived too much life, I don't believe that. It was not united by faith in those who heard. For we who have believed enter that rest, just as he said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. Help us, Lord, to understand that. Verse 7, same chapter. Today, saying through David, after so long a time, just as has been said to before, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Do not harden your hearts. Turn over to Hebrews chapter 11. Verse 13. We don't have time to go through the list of the heroes of faith, but this is the, the heroes of faith chapter. Hebrews 11, verse 13. All these died cynical. Is that what it says? Did they receive what God had promised them before they died? No, they did not receive it. Those who have ears to hear, hear what the Spirit is saying. Listen, there are things that you are going to see in God that you are never 
going to realize in this life. All these died in faith without receiving the promise. But having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For those who say such things make it clear that they are seeking a country of their own. Faith for the journey. A few weeks ago I was in a discouraged place and a good brother of mine knew about it and he called me up. And this really is what got me started on this and he said, you know Ray, it's a great life if you don't quit. I said, thanks, I needed to hear that. It's the last thing I wanted to hear because I wanted to quit. It's a great life if you don't quit. And then I heard the story told about Winston Churchill, who's considered to be one of the greatest orators of all time, who was invited to come back to his high school alma mater. The MC for the evening told all the students, he said, listen, this is the greatest orator of our time. He said, I want you to take copious notes. Listen carefully to what he says. Jot down everything he says, because it's very important. Winston Churchill got up after he was introduced, and he looked at those, that crowd of young people, and he said, never quit. And he said, never, never quit. And he said it again, never, 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 never quit turned around and sat down. Considered to be one of his greatest speeches he ever made. And I want to say to all of us, and I believe the Holy Spirit is saying to all of us, you've got dreams that the Holy Spirit has given you. You've got vision, and I've got vision. And the Holy Spirit wants to say to your spirit today, never quit. Never, 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 never quit. It will come to pass. The Bible says that a man or a woman is not fit for the kingdom after having put his hand to the plow and looking back. I want to say it again. Never quit. Get it out of your vocabulary. Allow the Lord to make course corrections along the way. Noah spent a hundred years building the ark. A hundred years. I don't think there's anyone here yet that has labored that long to fulfill what God has called you to do. I went in and saw Martha Johnson last Monday. The elderly saint here that worships with us. And I, she asked me to read some passages of Scripture to encourage her, and we had a wonderful time together, and then she got all teary-eyed. and She said, we talked about her passing from this life into eternity and spending time with the Lord, and then she got teary-eyed, and she said, oh, but Ray, she said, I have one desire that I've asked of the Lord. And I said, what's that? She said, I want to worship with my people in our new building before I go. And I left that place and I went out to the car and I said, oh God, I don't know when you're going to call her home, but if there's any desire that I would like to see fulfilled, I want to see Martha sitting out there with us when we're in that building. 
That was probably the biggest encouragement to me. It was like all of heaven said, just get out of the way because I'm going to make it happen. When she started to cry, she said, that's my, that's my, that's what I want to see. That's the deposit. I mean, that's what she is giving to us. She knows her time is limited. She's saying, God, there's some promises that I'll never see fulfilled. But she wants to die in faith. And her heart's desire is that she could worship with us at least one time on a Sunday in our new building. Never quit. Don't give up. Some of you have let the dreams die. You've allowed cynicism to rob you of what God has given you. Satan's biggest tool and most effective tool that he uses on Christians, and the story is told, and I will close with this, that Satan got into heaven somehow, and a saint passed from this life into heaven and got there, and he met other Christians, but he also met Satan, and he saw Satan had three tools up on a wall behind, as it were, like a trophy case. And he asked Satan about the nature of these tools. And the first two, two tools were um, not that significant, but yet they were important tools that Satan used. But the third tool was encased in gold. And the, the Christian turned to Satan and he says, what's that tool? And he says, oh, that's my main weapon that I use. It's the most effective weapon I have of all the weapons. And the Christian said, what is it? And Satan said, it's discouragement. It's the one I use the most and it's the most effective on the Christian. Discouragement. There's two things that I want you to do when we, as we leave today and this next week. I want you to look discouragement in the face and see it as your enemy. And the second thing, I want us to become a people of encouragement. Encouragement. The word encourage means to place him or her in their courage. To look my brother in the face and say, you can do it. You can do it. I'm with you. I'm standing with you. To place them in their courage. Faith for the journey. Never give up. Never quit. Never quit. For in due season, you will reap a harvest. In due season, you will reap a harvest. God is faithful. Amen? Amen. I've asked my father to come and uh, dismiss us this morning with a benediction. So would you stand, please? It's just a joy to have Dad here. Ask him to come and pray for us. Let me just say this. It's been a blessing for me to be here this morning. And... Many of you, I can recall when you first got a vision of who the Lord really is. And I can see that God has fertilized this and it has been growing. And I want you to know that I am for you and for the vision that God has given all of you as far as eternal life is concerned and the project that you are undertaking. I'm also glad to have our son Ray here as pastor. And as I mentioned before, as you knew that Lee was pastor of our church, but is no longer, I mentioned that the two that are most in our prayers are Lee and Ray because they have a great responsibility. So I want you to know that we wish you the Lord's blessing as you continue serving him. Let us bow our heads to be dismissed.
Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your presence here with us, and we know that you which have begun a good work in us aren't going to perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. And so, our Father, as you have spoken to us concerning where there is no vision, the people perish, and that you are the one that has given to us vision. You have given this people here a vision. And I pray that you would help them to wait upon you because you have said that they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And so our Father, it's a joy to see you work in our lives, in the life of your people. And I pray and believe that this congregation here has been placed here by you, and you have a purpose for them. They are not in obscurity, but they are in the public eye, and people are watching them. They are as a city set out on a hill. And I pray from this group, the love of Christ might reach this community, and many might come to know Jesus Christ. And now as we part, we do so in faith, in hope, and in love, knowing that our lives are in your hands. And we pray that you would keep each one of us till Jesus comes. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Be parting.